So this is actually a new part of the Cambridge syllabus. If I'm not mistaken, it was introduced last year, I think 2022 or 2023, right? And this concept is basically known as post-transcription mRNA modification. Wow, it's a mouthful. Post-transcription mRNA modification. And this occurs in eukaryotes only, not prokaryotes. Now, before we talk about post-transcription mRNA modification, let's just do a brief overview of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now, if you remember, prokaryotes are generally organisms, for example, bacteria, that do not have a nucleus in their cell. And therefore, their DNA, which is a circular naked DNA, is just floating around in the cytoplasm. Whereas for the eukaryotes, they have a nucleus and their DNA is located within the nucleus. For the prokaryotes, the ribosome is in the cytoplasm. The eukaryotes, the ribosomes are also in the cytoplasm or on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. I'm not drawing out the rough ER in this case. But the point I'm just trying to make over here is um, the prokaryotes have the DNA and ribosomes in the same area, which is the cytoplasm. But for the eukaryotes, the DNA is within the nucleus, but the ribosome is in the cytoplasm. There is a sense of separation. There is a separation that is happening between them for the eukaryotes. First thing to understand. So when the genes in the prokaryotes undergo transcription, the mRNA is produced and the mRNA undergoes translation and it will then produce the polypeptide. And all this entire process of transcription and translation happens within the cytoplasm of the prokaryote. However, for the eukaryotes, transcription happens within the nucleus and it produces the mRNA. The mRNA then goes out of the nucleus, enters the cytoplasm where translation happens. So transcription happens in the nucleus, translation happens in the cytoplasm, two different areas, and thus the polypeptide is produced. So you might go, okay, sounds pretty straightforward. A little bit more complicated for the eukaryotes because transcription happens in one place, translation happens in another place, but so what? Now, eukaryotes over here, when we look at the genes of the eukaryotes, when it undergoes transcription, the mRNA that is produced is actually referred to as something called the pre-mRNA. Pre meaning to say it is not mature yet. Now, I'm highlighting certain parts of the pre-mRNA. Certain uh, bases or certain nucleotides are, hi are highlighted with a blue, light blue color, and certain nucleotides are highlighted with like a pink color, if you can see that. Now, those blue color parts are referred to as something called exons, and EXONS, and the red color highlights are referred to as something called introns, which are called interrupting sequences. So here's the thing. What actually happens in post-transcription modification is, after transcription has happened, the mRNA has to undergo a bit of a modification. So the introns are referred to as interrupting sequences, which basically means disturbing sequences or sequences that are not supposed to be there. All right. So what happens within the nucleus is the introns are then removed or cut out of the mRNA. And the exons, as you can see, they're just floating around, but they cannot just float around. The exons are then spliced together or joined together. And this will then form something called the mature mRNA. And this entire process of post-transcription mRNA modification happens within the nucleus, in between transcription and translation. So the steps of post-transcription mRNA modification is as follows. The introns are removed from the pre-mRNA and the exons are spliced together. Simple as that. Now, there is a bit of an interesting thing. If introns are interrupting sequences or they are just basically useless, why do they even exist? Because you're like, you might be thinking, okay, why do eukaryotes have to go through these extra confusing steps? Prokaryotes don't need to do this, but eukaryotes do. And why do the mRNAs have useless sequences? 
Why does it have to be that? Why does the cell do things like this? There are a few possible explanations for this, and we are going to look at one possible explanation as to why introns, which we deem as something useless, exist. So, for example, in the eukaryotes, when transcription happens, it produces the pre-mRNA, in this case. I've highlighted the blue color areas as the exons, which are the important parts, and the red color areas as introns. If you notice the introns, I did not bother writing out the base sequences because we know that we don't need them, right? So what does the cell do? Remember, in the nucleus, the introns are first removed and the exons are then spliced together. And when the exons are spliced together, what actually happens, it produces the mature mRNA, and when it undergoes translation, looking at the mRNA table, I don't have to go into the detail, AUG codes for methionine, uh, GGG codes for glycine, AAA codes for lysine, CGC codes for arginine, valine, alanine, and histidine. And of course, UGA is the stop codon. So we have actually produced the um, polypeptide chain with the specific amino acid sequence. Now, if you notice, I'm actually circling the exons with different colors. So uh, one part of the exon I've circled in orange, one part of the exon I've circled in blue, another one in pink, and the last one in green, to just show you how they splice together. This helps us understand that when you look at the amino acids that I wrote in orange, they came from the first exon, the amino acids in blue, they came from the second exon, the pink one came from the third exon, and the histidine, which is the green amino acid, came from the last exon, which I've circled in green. So it's just, it's just as a guide, all right? Now, here's where post-transcription does something pretty spectacular. So the cell can also remove the introns. When it undergoes transcription again, the pre-mRNA is produced, okay? And the introns are removed, and of course, the exons are spliced, but notice something interesting. Look at how the exons are spliced here. The exons are spliced differently. For example, if you look at the exons on the left, it was orange, blue, pink, and green. But now, on the right, it is orange, pink, blue, and green. So the sequences of the exon are slightly different. Now, you might be thinking, oh shit, this is mutation. No, it's not. The cell actually does this deliberately. We call this phenomenon exon shuffling or exon juggling, where the exons are arranged slightly differently because when it does so and translation happens, look at the polypeptide chain sequence. The polypeptide chain sequence is slightly different, where on the left it was methionine, glycine, lysine, arginine, valine, alanine, and histidine, but on the right, it is methionine, glycine, valine, alanine, lysine, arginine, and histidine. The sequence is slightly different. The cell did this deliberately so that it can produce two different polypeptide chains, polypeptide chain A and polypeptide chain B. So you might go, oh, so that is the advantage of having introns. Because by having introns, by removing the introns, the cell can rearrange their exons to produce different types of polypeptide chains. It allows for one gene to code for different types of polypeptides if it wants to. That's the advantage that eukaryotes have over prokaryotes, because in prokaryotes, it cannot modify its mRNA. So one gene codes for one protein. But for eukaryotes, because it can modify its mRNA differently, it from one gene, it can code for different types of polypeptides. Thus, we can produce many different types of proteins, making us more complex organisms as compared to a bacterium.